It is Budget Eve and we've just had confirmation of one of the other big spending items in the budget, $1.9 billion to increase the single parent payment. Joining me live now for immediate reaction is the Nationals leader, David Littleproud. Uh, thanks so much for your time. You're back in Canberra. A chilly one, I hear. Uh, first, let's talk about this payment. Do you have any objections here? Well, I think we need to look at the totality of the budget. Obviously, um, the government's made it clear they wanted to help uh, those that are on social security payments to keep pace with inflation, even though there are indexed movements on that every six to 12 and 12 months. Uh, so we'll look at it in the totality and we need to look at it through the lens of what also happens with JobKeeper uh, and understand who's paying for it, because invariably it's going to be regional Australia. We lost $22 billion in the last budget, in the October budget, uh, that went to much of their spending. And I suspect now that uh, Catherine King's reviewing $120 billion worth of infrastructure projects, I suspect regional Australia will foot that bill. Uh, so that's what concerns us, particularly when there's been no investment in childcare. We haven't got childcare um, accessibility, uh, any, uh, any program looking to help us in rural and remote Australia to get childcare accessibility to fight uh, cost of living pressures that families are facing wanting to go back to work. Uh, so we we fear that that $4.7 billion that was spent last year on subsidies about affordability uh, is all that's going to be in the budget. And we're also concerned about regional health. They're putting uh, excise up on cigarettes, which go which is a tax on uh, our poorest families. Invariably, they're the ones that smoke and they're in national party seats. We represent seven of the most ten poorest seats in the country. Uh, but of the three-odd billion dollars they're going to recover out of that, we're not seeing anything go to regional health. So we're very concerned that regional health will be the ones that will pay the price. They stripped the cupboard in the last budget on, on uh, regional Australia and I think they're going to take the hinges off at this time, off the cupboard and leave us with nothing and pay for everything they want for the capital city. So we're very concerned as nationals. So you're worried about that tobacco excise. Uh, this is also the package to do with cracking down on, on vaping. You don't support any of that? Well, I think the fact that they're going to plain packaging, but uh, we've got very big concerns. The Nationals have a principled position that prohibition hasn't worked in the past. We did say that when we, if we are to put excise up, that we're to do that responsibly and that it's to be put into programs that help people get off cigarettes and e-cigarettes as well as regional health. Uh, and this is where we think this policy uh, will fail again, unfortunately, and not protect our children. We've got a model that has worked with, with cigarettes. We've seen that juvenile use of cigarettes have gone below 3% now. Uh, that's an 80% reduction since, uh, and to the credit of the, the uh, Gillard government, in bringing in restrictions on plain packaging and restricted sales through registered uh, convenience stores. That was the way that we've had success. That's a regulatory model that's worked. I think we need to use some common sense because when only 8% of Australians who are vaping at the moment have a prescription, I hardly think that they're going to quickly swap over when you walk the streets. And this government has already said they don't have a plan of how to tackle online purchases from overseas. And when you've got the Australian Federal Police Association saying they don't know how anyone's going to be able to police this, I just fear we're making the mistakes of the past. And we admit we, we actually supported as nationals that policy that Greg Hunt put in place. But you've got to admit when you got it wrong and you've got to look to models that work. Yeah. And what has worked in this country is how we've regulated cigarettes. Yeah, that's right. So isn't, I mean, you're right to say the prescription model that Greg Hunt put in place, uh, it's working for some, but it's an utter failure because the policy didn't take into account these disposable, coloured, um, flavoured things that you can um, buy quite easily. But as a principle, you know, yes, there's going to be gaps in this policy, but if it just simply makes it harder and more expensive for people to get, that's going to have an impact, isn't it? Well, we hope it works, but we, we're just looking at history and what yeah. has been put in place so in the what's past. Not and this part doesn't of this deviate too far. What you think needs to be included here? Well, well in fact, the, the, the model that we're going down a prescription path where only 8% of Australians who vape at the moment have a prescription, you are going to have to see a lot of appointments with doctors to get these prescriptions uh, to start this. Uh, and I don't think when there's availability uh, online for adults to sit there and go, well, I'm going to go to the doctor. Instead, they'll just go to Dr Google instead and start to order online. And to think you can pull it up at the border, 
uh, is fanciful. I mean, you, we're going from around 5 million containers to 8.5 million containers coming through our ports by the end of the decade. And to think that we're going to be able to pull all that up and we'll have the resources to pull up uh, some of these sale, online sales at the border is, mm. is not going to happen. So what you've got to do is look at what's worked, look at the practical reality. We don't dispute the science. Both cigarettes and e-cigarettes are bad for you. Yeah. Uh, and we want to get people off both of them. But how do we do that sensibly and in the practical reality rather than the ideology? Because the ideology didn't work and we've got to admit we got it wrong. I'm prepared and big enough to admit I got it wrong in supporting mm. Greg Hunt's model. So let's do something that has been proven to work. Let's use common sense and let's get protect children and get adults off both e-cigarettes and cigarettes. Yep. OK, let's talk more broadly about the cost of living uh, element to this budget. Now, we don't have all the details. It's 14.6 uh, $14 billion dollars worth of cost of living relief, we're told, over the forward estimates. What are you looking for in terms of the detail here to make sure it's not inflationary? Is that the kind of the number one test here? And Jim Chalmers has been pretty cautious, so you'd expect whatever's in this budget, he probably would have run past Treasury and got assurances and the RBA governor. Well, well, that obviously is the biggest test that Australians are facing at the moment is the inflationary pressures. So that's why you need to look at the totality of the budget measures, not just on the parenting payment, but also on, on JobKeeper. So, uh, sorry, uh, Job... Uh, I can't seeker. remember what the one is, the seeker. doll. It's job seeker. There's too many of them. Uh, <laughs> so effectively, we, we've got to make sure that we look at the totality of the budget, understanding where all the pressures are and where the inflationary pressures are. There's also big inflationary pressures. If you look at last month's inflationary numbers, mm. uh, a, big, a big chunk of that increase uh, was on energy. While there was a drop back on consumer spending in things like white goods, our, our actual costs on energy has gone up over 14%. And that's because this government has failed to engage with energy companies properly, particularly the gas sector. They've demonised them for nine years in opposition and then refused to talk to them, put in place measures like the safeguards mechanism, price caps, codes of conduct that have stripped away investment confidence that have said they're not going to drill any more holes. So we're drawing down on our supply. And then when you've got Paul Broad running around saying that uh, Anthony Albanese's model to get to 82% renewables by 2030 is fanciful, mm. uh, is putting a whole lot of pressure on your, on your cost of energy and now your reliability, you've got to ask the question about the ideology not matching the practical reality of what's being stripped out of your wallet. And this is where some common sense needs to prevail. We've got sovereignty of all our resources. Renewables have got to a point where all the easy, low-hanging fruit's been done, close to trans Transmission, existing transmission mm. lines, but we're, we're now going to have to expand and put 27,000 kilometres of extra transmission lines, 80 odd billion dollars worth, plus we're going to strip away prime agricultural land and knock down a native, native bushland to put in uh, solar panels and wind farms uh, to be able to get us to 82% when we have sovereignty of our resources with gas. Renewables can still be increased. We want to see them increase, but we need to supplement that with gas and also look at the emerging technology of small-scale modular nuclear. That's, this is where we've got the opportunity to get this right, but we, yeah. we shouldn't rush it because what, what this government has done has rushed it and put inflationary pressure on, on your uh, electricity bill, but also on your food bill, because processors are having to pay sometimes three, four times more than what they were previously to get food from the paddock onto your plate. Well, some Australians might not think we've rushed it uh, because, you know, we've been having this transmission line, we've been have, we're having this, you know, um, transferable power to renewables for a couple of decades now. Can you admit after AEMO said, you know, we need to get some of those transmission lines done sooner rather than later, perhaps not the entire package, but we've got to listen to your AEMO, don't we? That these transmission well, lines, at least some of them, need to start being upgraded and they should have been done years ago. Well, invariably the ones that say we haven't been going quick enough are the ones that can afford it. Uh, and this is where ideology needs to meet the practical reality of the impacts of those that do have to pay for it and also bear the impacts of transmission lines across uh, agricultural land that'll be mm. taken up, uh, that'll take away food security and push up your cost why, of food. Why is that? Can so you there is sensible way... to me how these transmission lines are going to help ha um, harm agricultural land? Because wouldn't it be temporary? No, no. These are these are permanent 80 metre towers with yeah. uh, six wires running across them, running across prime agricultural land, running What's the also. Problem with that? Uh, 
Well, so there, there is there a buffer is required um, underneath them to, to remain clear, and also obviously there's issues around emergency management, around bushfires, and about how you can how you can manage the landscape to minimise bushfires. But it's but also in terms of if the, you've got a, a multiple, you know, a hundred acre farm or something. I mean, the transmission lines... We're, we're really talking 27,000 kilometres, I'm sorry, um, yeah. to put it in perspective, 27,000 yeah, kilometres plus, 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 plus if you want to put it in perspective, you were going to put solar panels, I was in Wagga a month ago, and there's a 1,000 acres of solar panels going across cultivation land that produces wheat and canola that will yeah, be lost. that's different from transmission now, lines, right? So if we're no, going no, to stick on you've transmission look at lines, how, how much well, is this no, going no, to take because, up? No, no, so let's work, because they, they come together here, Laura, and what we're saying is a sensible solution for renewables. If you want to put it in a landscape where solar panels should go, look at rooftop, look at the capital cities, mm. and that is where the energy is required. And if you, take a, if, you, if you make it closer to its source, then you remove the need for the extent of transmission lines that are required. So the okay. landscape that should have solar panels on it should be those in capital cities, and for wind farms, they should be offshore, where the landscape uh, isn't, isn't impacted, and we're not, we're not knocking down th hundreds of thousands, if not millions of hectares of, of native bushland uh, to put these things on, as well as lose prime agriculture Land. So we're not against renewables. We're saying let's use a sensible solution that the coalition started about rooftop solar, making sure that it's close to the source that's required. And then if you put small-scale modular nuclear into where existing coal-fired power stations are, you don't need new transmission lines. You simply plug into where those old coal-fired power stations are. And unfortunately, you know, if you've got gas peaking plants and the Labor government called in curry curry uh, to think that they're going to turn it to green hydrogen, that's put it 12 months behind, that's putting more stress on top yep. of snowy hydro means that the decisions of this government has been rushed and based on ideology rather than practical reality and we're all paying for it. David Littleproud, good to speak to you. Budget tomorrow. We'll see you soon. Thanks.